In a significant development in 2019, the central government decided to discontinue the nomination of Anglo-Indians to the Lok Sabha and some state assemblies. This provision for the nomination of two Anglo-Indians to Lok Sabha was made under Article 331 of the Constitution. Moreover, as the current Jharkhand State Assembly is set to dissolve in 2024 preceding the state elections, Glenn Joseph Colston was set to be the final nominated Anglo-Indian MLA in the country. The term Anglo-Indian has evolved throughout history. Originally, it referred to British individuals working in India. However, it wasn't until Indian Census of 1911 that it officially became a category representing those of mixed Indian and European ancestry. Britain's almost two and a half centuries long presence in India created its own local Eurasian community called the Anglo-Indians, which are the descendants of marriages between English or other Europeans and local Indians. While we attempt to stir away from the oversimplified binary representation of Indian colonial history, the interactions of the colonizers and the colonized through the vantage of Anglo-Indian communities is an important aspect to understand. Anglo-Indians occupied a unique position within the colonial state, even though they benefited from the imperial power, yet they were not part of the European elite. Hello and welcome to Musala Trails, a podcast dedicated to all things South Asia. This is a sequel to our previous podcast India Colonized. In this new series, we interdwell not only the history of colonial South Asia, but also various aspects of the region, its people and the challenges they face. In this new episode, we talk to Dr. Uther Charlton Stevens to discuss the themes of his book Anglo-Indians and the End of Empire. Drawing from Uther's expertise, the episode explores the complex identities of Anglo-Indians in colonial India, the impacts of the political decisions of the British on their lives, their interaction with the nationalist movements, and the social complexities of the Indian and European societies that shaped the Anglo-Indian community. Dr. Uther Charlton Stevens is a lecturer at the Department of History, University of Hong Kong, teaching courses on the British Empire and the Second World War. A fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society, he earned his doctorate from the University of Oxford, and his research currently focuses on his father's community of mixed race Anglo-Indians in colonial India and Burma, which is the modern-day Myanmar, and similar groups of Eurasians in other former British colonies in Asia, including Singapore and his own hometown of Hong Kong. Hello Dr. Ruther, it is wonderful to have you with us and to get to discuss about your book Anglo-India and the End of Empire. Thank you so much for having me Ritika. I'm really pleased to be here. So before we dive right into discussing the themes of your book and other related uh, discussions around your book maybe we could start with you telling us a little bit about yourself how did you uh, how has your intellectual journey been like and how did you come to do about this particular project this book specifically Well I grew up in Hong Kong and I'm recording from here and uh, that's an interesting facet of my life experience because it was still under british rule when i was a child so i witnessed the handover and uh, i used to spend my summer holidays with my grandmother who is an anglo indian from south india from bangalore and she told me stories about her time in the women's auxiliary corps india during the second world war so i really imbibed a lot of the atmosphere of her colonial india or her anglo india um when i was a small child and and growing up and i became incredibly passionate about history once i was in high school and i really enjoyed studying history at oxford and then global history at the lse i returned to oxford to do my dphil in south asian history and um i've just grown the the research from from there this anglo-indian the end of empire is my second book on the topic 
Right, that's quite interesting to know. Um, so uh, maybe we could start with firstly knowing what do we really mean by Anglo Indians, and how and when did they came about to be known as one? Okay, so that is always a question which causes a little bit of confusion because if you um, if you're familiar with a lot of Raj fiction like E.M. Forster's Passage to India, he uses Anglo Indian to refer to the British in India. And that was the meaning which was generally used before 1911. And he was actually writing after this term Anglo-Indian was transferred onto the community of mixed race or mixed European and Indian descent, uh, who had been referred to as Eurasian in the 1901 census. And then in the 1911 census, they were recognized as Anglo-Indians. Anglo-Indians is the term that people of mixed descent wanted to be used for them because the term Eurasian was becoming very prejudicial, becoming increasingly racially charged um, from the 19th century onwards. So they campaigned to have their name redesignated to Anglo-Indian. But uh, for a lot of British authors and colonial British people, the term Anglo-Indian still in their mind referred to to the British. So it took some time for the new meaning to to catch up. But really that has been the official term for people of mixed heritage since 1911. And that has made its way through the colonial made constitutions and into the constitution of India. So that's the the sense in which I use the term Anglo-Indian. Right. And also for the sake of our audience as well, let me just put this in that uh, Article 366, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, also of the Indian Constitution specifically mentions what Anglo Indian, what the Anglo or definition of Anglo Indian is. Uh, But other than that, Dr. Ruther, uh, so like we cannot use Eurasian and Anglo Indian interchangeably as a term, right? I think that in India today, you shouldn't use those terms uh, interchangeably. It's a bit different um, in other places because I've been giving a lot of book talks in Hong Kong and here the term is Eurasian and in Singapore, the term is Eurasian. So I'm not uncomfortable with the term Eurasian. It's just that uh, in India, Anglo-Indians are a constitutionally defined community. So it's the appropriate term in an Indian context is certainly Anglo-Indian. But um, some Anglo-Indians, which I discuss in my book, still preferred the older designation Eurasian because they wanted to make a kind of common, broader, networked community with Eurasians in other parts of Asia. So you do you do still hear, hear both terms, but it, it's somewhat contextual because Eurasian is a more appropriate term in Hong Kong or Singapore. And Anglo-Indian is the constitutional term, so the proper name in in India. And that also, I think, applies in the Anglo-Indian diaspora. Anglo-Indians live around the world, many in Britain, like my own family, who migrated to Britain after independence, and large waves who went to Australia, especially Western Australia, smaller uh, groups moving to Canada and New Zealand. So it's a worldwide diaspora and the Anglo-Indian community reconnects every three years at international Anglo-Indian worldwide reunions, some of which have been held in India, Chennai and Calcutta, which I went to, and also some that I went to in in Australia, such as Perth and Sydney. Right. So uh, this, when we talk about the term Anglo-Indians, largely uh, it is talked about in association with the kind of marriages and relationships that uh, young British men and Indian women had, right? So like, did we also have similar sorts, sort of associations uh, coming in uh, during the East India Company or during the time of British Raj, Raj per se uh, in, the, uh, in the other colonies that were there in India, for example, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese? Did we have similar sort of uh, associations being propping up there as well? And what were their conditions as compared to the associations that were there uh, between the British and the Indians? So it's a complicated question, really, uh, which requires a longer answer. Um, I have a particular interpretation as well. 
which is that I see the Anglo-Indian community as it developed under British rule as being primarily the English-speaking community of mixed descent. And lots of people who were of Indo-Dutch or Indo-Portuguese or Indo-French background merged into the Anglo-Indian community. But I would say that uh, the core of the Anglo-Indian community in its earliest history was a primarily British Eurasian community. And as the late Christopher Hawes, another early historian of Anglo-Indians said, in the early days of the East India Company, those um, Eurasians who were not British, who merged into the group, tended to be Protestant, like uh, famously uh, DeRosio. De and um, so in the, in the earliest days of uh, British East India Company uh, rule, there were actually incentives for British men to marry local women. But this didn't just mean Indian women. It also meant uh, Catholic women who were Indo-French and Indo-Portuguese. So in Madras, and I'll use the colonial era names when they're appropriate, so modern Chennai, uh, in Madras, there was actually a payment which was made to, um, to couples who married um, a British man and a local woman when their child would be baptized as a Protestant. So in the early days, the East India Company's footholds were more tenuous and the ideas about race and color had not become so um, extreme as they would in the 19th century, and especially the late 19th century when there was something that we called scientific racism. Um, in those early days, there might have been various forms of prejudice, but the primary concern of the company was with their rivalries with the other European powers and the rivalry between Catholics and Protestants. And they wanted to ensure that um, their footholds would become stronger. So having more children from British men would be helpful, but they wanted to ensure that those children were Protestant and would be loyal to England and not Catholic and potentially uh, supportive of France or Portugal. So therefore, there was this encouragement. They paid a uh, pagoda, a gold coin, uh, upon, upon the marriage and the baptism of the, uh, the child to Protestant Christianity. And it's important to see that the... These wives were not just Indian women. They were also uh, already mixed Indo-Portuguese and Indo-French women. So there is a, a complicated European and Indian mix from, from the beginning. But there were also, of course, Indian women, some of whom converted to Christianity and were married, some of whom were had informal relationships with uh, ordinary British soldiers, uh, who were, of course, the largest number of, of, of British people, British men in India. And it tended to be um, Muslims or perhaps uh, lower caste women who would be more likely to convert. But there were also some prominent cases of Rajputs and uh, um, Hindu princesses, as well as Mughal Muslim uh, princesses and aristocratic begums during the late Mughal courtly world. And that is quite well explored in William Dalrymple's book, White Mughals, as well as in several other uh, books that cover the 19th century. So there has been a history that has been told about the origins of this community, which are complicated. But I feel my book is the first to, both of my books together are the first to really tell the story from a professional historian's vantage and take it into the 20th century. So for example, so when you mentioned that there were, let's say, low caste women who were wanting to, let's say, convert, they were marrying and plus there were other Muslim women, women from uh, Hindu backgrounds, etc. So was there only, uh, not only, but was there mostly a particular class and caste of people between whom 
these associations uh, like came into uh, place well i think that uh, basically the caste system um meant that it was less likely for higher caste uh, hindu women to be willing to exit their caste um although in some cases th- this happened um so sikandar sahib who's very famous uh, james skinner uh, founder of skinner's horse which is a tank regiment in the in- indian army his mother was a rajput princess and uh, so there were high status hindu women who uh, married powerful and important uh, european mercenaries during the early days of the east india company but generally speaking uh, most of those marriages were with muslim women who were you know fit into dalrymple's picture of the white moguls of the the begums um kair un nisa and uh, kirkpatrick the, those kind of elite relationships and then you had a long period into the early 19th century when there were not many european or british women in india and so the daughters of other east india company officers and their indian or mixed race wives would be the most suitable wives for younger east india company officers so you had a long period where there were many many marriages between east india company men especially officers and mixed race women who were multi generational mixed race women and that's interesting because it it created a tendency for the situation for mixed race girls and mixed race boys to split and the prospects for the the girls through marriage were better for a longer period of time even at the same time as there were there began to be economic prescriptions and prohibitions on mixed race men so around the time of the 1790s there were a series of prohibitions there was one a decade earlier and another a decade following but they were mainly in the 1790s and the east india company then reversed its earlier policy of incentivizing and paying for uh mixed marriages and then instead started to penalize uh mixed race young men by prohibiting them from serving in the east india company's army in its marine in its offices although except as regimental musicians and uh, bandsmen but in practice even though they came up with these prohibitions and they tried to stop the the pattern of of british men who were who had the resources who had the money to send their mixed children back to england that was a common pattern in the early period they tried to stop this and to say that uh, orphan children should not be sent back to uh, to britain to be educated and mixed race men should not be given employment in most of the east india company services except in these very junior roles as as musicians and bandsmen and that was a complete reversal of the earlier policy of incentivizing mixed mixed marriages and that helped to create a political identity especially around the 1820s so these prohibitions were in the 1790s so by the 1820s you start to have a series of petitions from all of the three company presidencies bengal madras and bombay where they are objecting to the the restrictions that that have been placed on mixed race men and those restrictions meant that mixed race men then tended to be forced into other professions mainly into clerkships so before bengalis english speaking bengalis became prominent and in as stereotypical bengali babu clerks and and that was sort of racialized and uh, a negative stereotype developed by the british before that most of the clerks were actually eurasians as that was the common term in the 19th century east indians indo britons eurasians and so eurasian men had these disadvantages that they couldn't find easy employment despite this there were still mixed race men who managed to succeed at the highest level in military service in ignoring this ban they got around it through their connections or through their luck or in some cases they might have been lighter skin color so they could pass they could look like they were english but in other cases you know james 
Skinner was uh, was certainly not white looking, and he remained very successful and and important. So the company's ban was not wholly effective, but it pushed most mixed race men into the position of just being junior clerks, and uh, that meant that the position of mixed race girls in the early nineteenth century was still better because they still could marry uh, East India Company officers and high class men, so they could effectively remain attached to the British colonial society as these prohibitions pushed the group to to separate from the British. And as you go later into the 19th century, effectively, the mixed race group, the Eurasian community, or the Indo-Britain and or East Indian community becomes a separate community, and it marries within its own ranks. And it is something detached from colonial British society. But that is a gradual process through the early 19th century. So before we uh, move into the other dynamics of how did this uh, transition from uh, like sort of uh, promoting these marriages to like again sort of discriminating against these uh, marriages happen, before that I would, uh, I would like to know that how were these marriages specifically uh, seen amongst different religious groups in India? Well, I think um, it's useful to expand the discussion a little bit uh, beyond just India, because, of course, Burma is later conquered by the British and integrated into the Indian Empire, and it's treated as a an Indian province until the Government of, of India Act 1935 and the Government of Burma Act 1935 which is then implemented in 1937, and that separates constitutionally India and Burma so that Burma becomes a separate colony. And the attitudes towards mixing amongst the Burmese Buddhists are an interesting counterpoint. So there is a, an Anglo-Indian author who lives in New Zealand, Dorothy McMenamin. She's written, recently written another book on Anglo-Indians in Pakistan. And she makes a strong case that Muslim attitudes in what would become in the Northwest, uh, which she focuses on, which would become modern Pakistan, were quite different from Hindu attitudes to um, intermarriage across uh, interfaith lines. And I, I suppose that it's more about caste and religion, really, than it is about attitudes to race um, in the case of Indian attitudes. But the views about caste are very strongly held. So she argues that uh, effectively by having mixed marriages or mixed cohabitations, those women would become outcasts with, within the, the caste system and would cut themselves off from their families. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, I believe there's a particular community in southeastern India where um, women were able to, to marry uh, out, outside of their caste and their religion and still retain their, their status. But that's a kind of anthropological, you know, individual case. Generally speaking, the Hindu caste system is, is not favorable to these, to these unions. And so by entering into these unions, you're exiting from the, the Hindu community and, and your original caste group. And sometimes that involves converting to Christianity. But this explains why, generally speaking, uh, Muslim women were much more, in the late Mughal courtly world, were much more likely to marry Europeans. And of course, there would have been a large number of um, lower caste uh, women who, who followed the, the army and who had relationships that were less formal with uh, ordinary British soldiers. So there are many different origins. A lot of these were officially um, sanctioned marriages. Some of the marriages took place in the early days under Islamic rites. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, many married in, in Christian churches. And as Durba Ghosh's work shows, um, the baptismal records and the marriage records um, tended to obscure the, the Indian ancestry by the, the Indian woman who converted would be given a Christian name, just a first name, and she would just be recorded as Alice or uh, Mary, and then it's difficult to see what her original caste community may have been. So that, that makes it more difficult to, to rediscover some of these detailed genealogies. So most Anglo-Indians don't have a very strong sense of where their 
Indian ancestry comes from. They have a much better sense of their, their European ancestry. And of course, that's, that's reflected in, in, in their surnames. So if you have a, if somebody's surname is Ramsey, it's a very different thing than if their surname is Ramaswamy. And um, another aspect, of course, is that there were mixed marriages in the other direction. Um, this was much less common, but there were mm -hmm. Indian men, especially in, in the late colonial period, in the 20th century, who married European women. And generally speaking, because their children were um, took their, their father's surname, an Indian surname, they were not uh, seen as separate from the Hindu society or Indian society. Um, and they tended to be integrated with Indian society. So, of course, um, you know, famously, the, the, Gandhu, the Gandhi Nehru dynasty now is, is also um, of mixed European and Indian descent. But they're not classified as Anglo-Indian because Anglo-Indian has a very specific constitutional definition yeah. that mainly developed in the Government of India Act 1935 and then is carried over into the Indian Constitution, mm. which specifies that it's European descent in the male line. And that definition is silent about the Indian ancestry. Um, so it actually gives a space because for a long time, many Anglo-Indians and so-called domiciled Europeans, they didn't want to acknowledge their Indian ancestry. Even some who had darker skin would say that they didn't have Indian blood. I'm talking about, of course, in the 1920s, the 1930s. And you know, some of those attitudes lingered on much later. So... There is a lack of awareness amongst many Anglo-Indians about their the Indian side of their heritage, but a stronger awareness of the the European side. Right. Uh, so that that was also one of the questions that I was about to come to. That because uh, you've also mentioned that the constitutional definition of Anglo-Indian specifically mentions the. Uh, male bloodline that who would be classified as Anglo Indians, but uh, so when it came to uh, Indian men marrying, um, let's say, uh, marrying uh, European women or women of European descent, so how was in that particular time? How was that really seen by the British? Number one, and by the Indian Indian or, or let's say the colonial subjects, if I were to say, and was there was there any particular apprehension that was seen uh, from both of these sides about these particular very limited uh, relationships that were also happening? Well, because I think I'm sure it, there are very limited examples of the same. Well, I think there are more than you than you expect. There, are, I think there are many, many more than you expect. I mean, you know, from the period of about 1920 to. Uh, to 1947. I think there will be many more such relationships than we would imagine in absolute terms. So I think that there were many, many cases, but of course, in the context of the size of the Anglo-Indian community, this very large, very large mixed community in terms of mixed race populations around the world, it's a very small micro community in terms of the population of India, you know, maybe 200,000 people at most around the time of independence. Um, but it, this is a very large group compared to um, individual uh, marriages between Indian men and, and European or Anglo-Indian women. But there were many, many such individual cases, and you find them scattered around, you know, if you read biographies within the nationalist movement, you often find that uh, there are many such relationships. And uh, even before the recent... Um, mixing in the uh, Nehru Gandhi dynasty at uh, Jawahal Nehru had uh, had a relative who's um, who married an English woman so th that was not that un uncommon amongst the uh, the middle class uh, better educated Indians and I, I think that generally speaking the British would ignore such cases except that there were very notorious cases of among the Indian princes so the princely rulers, um, often had uh, uh, scandalous relationships with with uh, multiple uh, European women in succession, or some of them married European women. And some of the women that the, the Indian princes married tended to be um, women who might be uh, dancers or um, actresses or, or, or have some kind of reputation that, that made everything 
both more glamorous and more scandalous at the same time. So uh, I, I believe there, there's a book um, on, on that subject called uh, Wicked Women of, of the Raj. Um, so th there are many, many such individual cases. And as I, I mentioned in, in my book, I don't cover that topic directly, but it comes up because Indians at the time point out that, well, you have this identity which which in the 1930s is, is making you feel very separate from the rest of Indian society. But what about my friends and relatives who have English wives and their children? They are completely integrated with us and they don't have the same identity and complexes that you do. That's a That was the, the case I, I mentioned earlier, that example of if your name is uh, Ramsey or your name is Ramaswamy, it will have a huge d impact on your life. That's a case that I've mentioned in the book. Right. And that uh, sort of the question of identity that you mentioned, um, that sort of gets me uh, to a point. So, for example, when it, come, when it came to the question of, let's say, nationalism or identity pre-independence, so what kind of spaces did these men and women hold in in context to that particular uh, notion? Because, of course, they're uh, post-1900s uh, and uh, let's say post 1857, for that matter. Gradually, there was an increase in the entire nationalist movements, etc. So how did these uh, men and women, what kind of spaces did they hold? And uh, of course, there's a, there's this account in your book as well, which talks about how they sided uh, even during the uh, rebellion of 1857, uh, most of Anglo Indians sided with the uh, British Empire. But in general, if I were to talk about what what kind of spaces, what kind of interactions did they have when it came to their identity, especially in the context of uh, nationalism per se, pre independence. Well, it's, it's almost as if the Anglo-Indian community was on a completely different trajectory from the, 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 Indian middle, the educated Indian middle classes. It's like they lived in a parallel world um, and, and that they were in a different stage of, of historical development, that they were mentally in a different time period almost. Um, and it is interesting that, uh, in a sense, um, colonial British society, its culture, its, um, its dress, its norms, its values, it, they tended to lag behind social change in Britain. Um, so essentially, there was always a kind of um, Victorian element to, to the late colonial British society. And um, they always seemed to be at least a, a generation behind what was happening in Britain in terms of social change and um, change in women's lives and expectations and experience, women's involvement in the workplace. And one interesting dimension of that is that Anglo-Indian women were extremely liberated and highly involved in the workplace. And that actually deterred colonial British women from entering various forms of paid employment in India because it, these like nursing, uh, dancing, ballet schools, um, typing, um, telecommunic early telecommunications, you know, wireless operators and so on. These were strongly associated with mixed race women, with Anglo-Indian women. Therefore, British women didn't want to do those jobs because they didn't want to be suspected of being Anglo-Indian. That was not completely true in nursing because elite British imported nurses still uh, dominated over Anglo-Indian nurses. But in, in most fields, there was a, a desire of... Um, British women not to be associated with, with Anglo-Indian women. So in that one respect, the Anglo-Indian community and Anglo-Indian women were much in advance of the other communities because you could find individual cases of um, Indian women doctors, uh, medical doctors. However, in many other respects, the Anglo-Indian community also lagged behind not just social change in Britain, but they lagged behind the the dress and, and attitudes of the colonial British population. So they were almost a generation or half a generation behind in their own attitudes. And despite the very negative sexualized stereotypes of Anglo-Indian women that are prevalent in fiction and then later in a lot of films, um, in the interwar years, in, in the 1930s, 
the the attitudes to courtship in the Anglo-Indian community were very conservative. You know, Anglo-Indians tended to be more religious than than the British, more fervently um, Christian. Um, and although, as I said in earlier in in the talk, there was this uh, tendency for Protestantism to be important in the early history of this community. By the 20th century, the, the majority of Anglo-Indians were Catholic, like my family. And so this attachment to, to religion, to Christianity, and particularly Catholicism, and to a lesser extent, Anglicanism, Methodism, um, there were many Baptists, that uh, meant, in combination with attitudes from an earlier area, Victorian or Edwardian, that Anglo-Indians would tend to regulate their uh, children's courtship behavior more strictly than British parents. They, they would not allow their daughter to go dancing without a chaperone, without being supervised. So that is, is more identifiable to the Indian middle classes as well. But Anglo-Indians, of course, they behaved in some respects more like the British. You know, they, they drank alcohol, they had parties, um, but they were still operating on the, the sort of rules and norms of Edwardian British society about how, how young women should be chaperoned and, and looked after, and they couldn't just go off on their own and, and have a canoodle with, with some man they just met. So despite a lot of the stereotypes and despite the aspiration of many Anglo-Indian women to marry British men, which was certainly the case because it, it gave them an advantage, a possible way of moving up um, because the British subordinated the Anglo-Indians, marrying a, a British man or European man because an Anglo-Indian woman was fairer skinned perhaps and she could pretend to be British, that was a really significant way in which she could improve her life chances. And of course, on the cover of the book is, is Merle Oberon, who's famous Hollywood film star, who's, whose whole career was based on the fiction that, uh, that she was born in Tasmania in Australia and, and not in Bombay and that she wasn't Anglo-Indian when, of course, she was. So I think that uh, the Anglo-Indian community lived in a sort of bubble where, and they lived around these railway colonies because the bulk of the community was reliant on employment in the telegraphs and the railway services. Therefore, in these little enclaves, the railway colonies with their little railway institute where only Anglo-Indians were members there and they had little railway schools. And then, of course, there were... Um, European schools, which were often dominated by Anglo-Indian students, English language schools, they lived very separate lives from the Indian middle classes. And I give a few examples that run counter to that, where some Anglo-Indian parents sent their um, sons to, to Indian universities. But generally speaking, they didn't participate in the same um, studies with, with, with the other Indian communities. So they were very detached from Indian nationalism, and they were reacting to their own problems, and they were developing their own sense of how their own goals, their goals in the early 20th century were to equalize their status with the British, to remove the discriminations that separated them from enjoying the, uh, the privileges that the British enjoyed. They wanted to be given access to the same jobs as the British. So that is a very different kind of struggle than the, the freedom struggle, than, than the, the non-cooperation movement. They were going off in a totally different direction. And I do talk about the exceptions and the, the interesting crossovers, but those tended to be individual Anglo-Indian politicians who took a very different attitude to most of the community. Said, um, and would it would it be right to say that the kind of detachment that they felt uh, from the larger uh, the larger narrative that was there during that time, in your words, they were in a bubble per se. So, can that be number one credited to the kind of discrimination that they faced, specific specifically from the British side, and of course the kind of uh, lineage they, that they had because they were Anglo-Indians, would that be right to say, or if I'm getting that right? Well, the discriminations that they faced are complicated because in a sense, they were given some 
privileges above other Indians in, in the period around uh, 1900 to 1930. They enjoyed many privileges that were not okay. accessible to other Indians. And so they were placed in an intermediary position between the British and so-called domiciled Europeans and other Indian communities. This was in areas like the railways predominantly, which was not really the, the the mainstay of employment for the educated Indian middle classes. But it did mean that they were in a privileged position relative to the bulk of the Indian population. So discrimination operated both in favor and against Anglo-Indians. So they, they had a better starting position and, and certain opportunities, certain niches, which were given to them, but they had a kind of glass ceiling above which they were not able to rise unless they could pass as European, unless they could, in, in the cases of lighter skinned members of the community, unless they could pretend that they were Europeans and therefore manage to get into the, the British grades of employment. Um, Anglo-Indians were patriotically attached to, to Britain and the imperial monarchy. And you can question, you know, is that inevitable or is that natural when your paternal ancestry is European? If your name is European and you identify yourself with uh, the British Indian government, then is, is that a natural state of affairs? Probably in the context of the time, because the, there were actually a large, larger number of loyalist communities, including zamindars, including uh, princes, including a lot of business people, um, and even you know within nationalist families, you would often have a, a loyalist uncle who who was who was had different views because views don't tend to be a hundred percent. So with with hindsight, you know the current direction of historiography to suit our current expectations and attitudes is to basically downplay um, the substantial amount of support for the British Raj that existed within certain segments of Indian society right, right up till 1947. Um, strong elements of support within the army, e even when there are obvious counterexamples like the, the Royal Indian Navy mutinies uh, ju just before independence. Still, there was substantial uh, bases of support and it, what we would now term to be collaboration with, with the British Raj within wider in Indian society. And that was not only Muslims. It was not only certain communist political parties. It, it extended across the society. So with hindsight, everyone was in favor of the freedom struggle, right? And of course, if you hadn't always been in favor of the freedom struggle, once the freedom struggle achieved its objectives, it would be a good idea for you to say that you always had been, you know? But people's attitudes changed over time. There were different yeah. generations of people coexisting with each other. And for a very long mm -hmm. time, the older generations of nationalists were very happy with the idea of remaining within within the, the empire or the commonwealth in a, in a broader sense, as long as they achieved self-government, as long as they were treated like the self-governing dominions of Canada and Australia. So the aspirations were, were complicated and the attitudes to the monarchy were, were complicated as well. And, uh, but certainly in that context, the Anglo-Indians were more fervently monarchist for much of the late colonial period than most other Indian communities. And that was because of their claimed ties of kinship and blood with the British. They, they claimed to be the sons and daughters of the British and therefore their level of identification with Britain, their, their sense that India was an imagined homeland was very, very powerful for, you know, right up until the Second World War at least. But at the same time, there were moves within the political leadership of the Anglo-Indian community to shift their identity. So Sir Henry Gidney, the political leader before Frank Antony, he was trying to slowly shift the community to, to identify more with India. So instead of just feeling that they are British people of mixed descent who live in India, he wanted to, them to embrace their Indian motherland and to feel that they had a British fatherland and an Indian motherland. 
And it was easier for him to make that case that we should love and identify with India as our motherland by holding on to his own belief that uh, India would remain attached to the British crown in the future. India would become a self-governing dominion, but the, uh, the king would still be the monarch. And that was the comfortable world in which he was developing his politics, in which his patriotism for India and his patriotism for Britain and his patriotism for the imperial monarchy could all be combined. You know, for him, the idea that you would have to choose between India and Britain was, was a painful thing because he felt that he was somebody of British and Indian heritage and he could create a bridge. But he was at the same time fighting against very conservative, even more pro-British forces, traditional conservative forces within the Anglo-Indian community who were resisting his leadership. And they didn't like how much he was prepared to state that he was an Indian national and that he loved his Indian motherland. So his tentative steps in the direction of greater embrace of identification with India then are superseded by the even more radical reorientation carried out by Frank Antony. Frank Antony realizes that the British are going to effectively abandon the Anglo-Indian community, that they are not going to do very much to help them, especially after the, the Cripps mission and the cabinet mission which makes it clear to Antony and earlier to Gidney just before his death that um, the British are not willing to intervene on Anglo-Indians' behalf in creating a constitution for India that will give a continuing special status for Anglo-Indians. Frank Antony turns to the Congress party leaders, and that's a story that I tell in great detail in this book, he turns to uh, Vallabhai Sardar Patel, to Jawaharlal Nehru, and to Mahatma Gandhi, and he, he makes his case as strongly as he can that we are Anglo-Indians by community, but we're Indians by nationality, and we are absolutely going to be as loyal and supportive of the future Indian government, of which we should be a part, as we were to the British colonial Indian government. So we have been loyal servants of the state in the past, even though it was a colonial state, and we will be loyal servants of the state uh, for India's bright future. That is what Antony does when he tries to persuade Anglo-Indians to go even further and to embrace Indian nationality and Indian identity as their nationality, into which he can fit a nested Anglo-Indian community identity. Right. Since we're all, uh, talking about Frank Antony and you mentioned uh, about Sir uh, Henry Gidney, uh, it was during uh, his uh, attempt that All India Association for Anglo-Indians also uh, came up during that time, which exists till uh, to date. So could you also talk a little bit about, uh, in brief, if you could just like talk a little bit about how was the interaction of All India Association for Anglo-Indians like with other political parties at that point in time, specifically uh, the Indian National Congress? Well, I think before we get to the, the relationship with the Congress party, we should first note that Gidney, outside of his own Anglo-Indian Association, his most serious involvement with another political party was with the Unionist Party. And as you may know, the Unionist Party actually managed to win one of the provincial elections in, in Punjab and form an administration. So he was one of the founding galvanizing forces in the creation of the Unionist Party, but he didn't remain heavily involved with it from, from what I can see. Of course, the separate electorates and the communal politics created by separate electorates uh, meant that uh, the Anglo-Indian Association was the primary arena of Anglo-Indian politics. But according to Frank Antony, when Gidney addressed civic bodies in Madras and other, other cities in India in the 1930s, these weren't Congress party bodies, but they were um, substantially populated by uh, members of the Congress party. He was well received and he wasn't viewed as a narrow communalist. And the Indian Congress uh, party members appreciated that he was quite consistent in condemning uh, 
racial discrimination in the employment of the colonial state. So he was trying to safeguard Anglo-Indians' own reserved positions in the railways and telegraphs and customs services. But he was at the same time criticizing the colonial state for discriminating against Indians and Anglo-Indians. And that was well received by supporters of the Congress party. And he does develop ties with some, uh, some Indian politicians. But as I discuss in the section on the round table conference, he was much closer, um, closely aligned with um, Dr. Ambedkar in resisting Gandhi's policies at the round table conferences in London. So he was really not aligned with the Congress party at all. He was more in, in opposition to the, the Congress party, but he had individual friendships with members of the Congress party and he was well respected by members of the Congress party as a major figure on the Indian political scene at the time. And then when Frank Antony takes over, he becomes increasingly close to the Congress leadership, but he always wants to maintain that the Anglo-Indian Association is a distinct body with its own status, its own identity, and that it is not going to become a tool of another political party. And, you know, right up till partition, he maintains an attempt to have a dialogue with Jinnah and the Muslim League about the future of Anglo-Indians in what will become Pakistan. Uh, he sees that as necessary, but it's increasingly clear from the time of the Sapru uh, committee at which he speaks onwards that he is very strongly aligned with the nationalist movement and that he is in sympathy with the aims of the Congress party, but he wants to maintain the Anglo-Indian Association as an independent political force. Right. I think there's an interesting trajectory that you've uh, just established starting from how did Anglo-Indians came to be in the first place and now we move towards um, how how is their interplay with the nationalist movement, with the uh, independence movement whatsoever. So that sort of gets me to the question that, um, and because your the contribution of your book also has been such that, knowing about these sort of interactions, of course, intersectionalizes the way we look at history. It sort of takes us away from, uh, let's say, the binary lens that we may use of the colonized and the, uh, the you know, the colonial uh, uh, people uh, in, in, in the way we interpret or look at history for that matter. So in your view, how does that, uh, you know, impact the way the contribution of your book, number one, and this intersectional lens that we put to looking at, uh, in this case, uh, specifically uh, the Indian colonial history, in what all ways, in, if you could just like talk about that in brief, in your opinion, sort of uh, nuances the way we look at Indian history? Uh, yeah, just, just that I want to know. Well, I've, I've also noticed um, from some of your previous talks that biographies are becoming a, a more popular a form of uh, historical writing at present in India. And, um, you know, when we look at biographies, we realize that individual lives and changing attitudes are very complex. And to create a very simplistic narrative that, you know, somebody always had a certain set of beliefs and they always consistently advanced those beliefs and they had no contradictory tendencies and the outcomes were inevitably the way that they were, that's really exploded by any good biography. You know, any good biographical writer sees that. And, you know, in some ways, you, you could see my book as, as a biography of the Anglo-Indian community at the time, um, collectively. And, and also it contains biographies of various individuals, um, Merle Oberon, Boris Karloff on the international stage, and Frank Antony and Sir Henry Gidney, and other individuals who are less well-known, like... Um, uh, Irene Green, the nursing sister whose story I draw out at great length. And yes, the complexity of these stories, the nuances are so important because that binary idea of um, colonizer and colonized and the racial binary is really far too simplistic. Um, so I hope that I certainly explode that. And one of the very great themes that I try to emphasize is the concept of racial passing. And um, I don't think that that weakens my, my implicit argument that there was a strong community of Anglo-Indians in the late colonial period. 
But the fact that there were people moving across these boundaries and there was all of this racial passing and there were all these arguments about how to define individuals, I think that is also an important part of the story. Right, um, exactly. Because, uh, and uh, from the context of the book as well and from the entire conversation that we've had here, it is the entire uh, sort of fitting the history into just looking at these were the colonizers and these were the colonized also sort of um this is is in a way discrimination uh towards the complex for example in this case anglo-indian community as well and different such communities that must have existed at that point in time and must have cropped up at that point in time and the experiences that they must have had so in that context one last question i have for you dr ruther so in the modern day context so when um, indian constitution came into place we had these two reservation uh, seats uh, reserved seats for the anglo indians in the, uh, in the indian parliament Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the Lok Sabha, in the Indian Parliament. But uh, pretty recently in 2020, um, I assume, uh, if, yeah, in 2020, these were scraped off and there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, voices that came up specifically from the leader, the Indian leaders who belong to Anglo-Indian communities that uh, they, of course, weren't really, uh, you know, consulted before it was done, although it was put in place that it will be sort of, um, you know, scraped off after 40 years. But then the consecutive governments kept sort of, uh, you know, increasing the timeline of it. And then suddenly in 2020, it was scraped off. So, of course, there are there are a lot of uh, voices that say, you know, that the Anglo-Indian community either should be given the status of the minority community in India. And then, of course, in all of that, all of those dynamics, how do you see, uh, what kind of spaces do you, do you see the Anglo-Indian community today, let's say, holds in India and where, how far, where do you see all of this going, specifically with context to India, if you have any well, opinions to share? Yes, well, I, I co, at the time at which it was mooted that they were going to withdraw the special nominated seats in the Lok Sabha and in the state legislatures, I co-authored a letter with um, academic colleagues in this field, Dolores Chu and Robin Andrews, to the Hindu, um, which in which I we collectively together argued that Anglo-Indian um, reserved seats and nominated seats should continue, and that's because the the position of the Anglo-Indian community is not as uh, rosy as was suggested. Um, at the time when when these were um, suspended or, or were brought to an end. Um, so I, I think that within the Anglo-Indian community in India, there's, there's a hope that those will be restored because I suppose that it goes back to the, the original arguments made in, in the time of the framing of the constitution that really the cost to the wider society of, of supporting the, the heritage of this small minority um, which has done great services to India, is a very small cost. And uh, unfortunately, since independence, Anglo-Indians have never been enumerated in official censuses. Therefore, it was quite easy for the government to say, well, we don't know how many there are. There may, may be very few, and many Anglo-Indians have moved to Australia and other countries. Um, but the Anglo-Indian community is in India is still sizable. It's vibrant. It's dynamic. It's very well integrated now with Indian national life. It increasingly was ever since independence, but particularly now. And there, if if the Anglo-Indian community is in any way decreasing, it's probably as a result of intermarriages with with other communities in India, which I think is healthy and and natural. But it is still an important force that supports the. Um, the, the wider society, and especially in respect of educational provision. And so many Indians who I've met have fond memories of Anglo-Indian teachers who left a lasting impact on them. So I think that the community deserves to retain its special position in India and that it would be sad if... Um, if the the removal of these uh, nominated seats um, were to diminish Anglo-Indians' 
prospects for future contributions to Indian society. Right. I think that's an um, interesting point to come to an end for this interview. It was really amazing talking to you, Dr. Ruther, and the amazing conversation that we have had. Uh, before we go off, uh, please go ahead and pick the book, The Anglo uh, India and the End of Empire. I'm sure it is going to interest a lot of, oh, yes, here's the book uh, with Dr. Ruther. And yeah, just like order it on Amazon. Mostly that's the most accessible way most of the students can access the book. And yeah, uh, Dr. Ruther, if you'd want to plug in anything related to the book, your social handles, etc., please. Well, thank you so much for having me on the program. Um, it's been a really wonderful experience and uh, you're an excellent interviewer with so much knowledge to, uh, to draw out this history in, in the best way possible. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Uther CS, U-T-H-E-R-C-S. And I have the same handle for my face, Facebook page. And there's also a Facebook page for, for the book, which is facebook.com slash Anglo Indian history, one word with no hyphen. And I'm on various other platforms as well. So I'd welcome your listeners to get in touch with me, ask me further questions and follow my future publications. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning into this episode. If you found this discussion intriguing, then I'd recommend you read Uta's other insightful book, Anglo-Indians and Minority Politics in South Asia. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review or feedback for us on whichever podcast listening platform you prefer. Your feedback is invaluable to us in not only helping us better our work, but also it helps us reach more listeners who can benefit from these discussions. If our work at Ergo helps you in engaging with academic debates, research and ideas more comprehensively, please consider following us on Instagram and Twitter or supporting us through Buy Me A Coffee.